Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show, your home for open, honest, and provocative conversations. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show and our true crime Christmas week here on the program. Going to take you back now to July 15th, 2008, when Cindy Anthony of Florida first reported her granddaughter Kaylee missing. A fact she only learned one month after the child had disappeared. Cindy had no idea that her grandchild was missing because that child, she believed, had been with its mother, Casey Anthony. Casey Anthony had been claiming that she and her little girl were on a trip together. When Grandma called, she just kept telling Grandma that little Kaylee couldn't talk. But then a fateful event took place. You see, the car that Cindy, that's the Grandma, had lent her daughter, Casey, wound up in an impound lot. Cindy and her husband, George, the parents of Casey, were called by the towing company. They thought Casey was off on vacation with little Kaylee. They didn't understand why she'd be separated from the car. But they went to the lot, they examined the automobile, and suddenly their minds were flooded with questions. A few phone calls later, and they realized Casey had been lying to them. She had not been on a vacation somewhere. She had been staying with some boyfriend. But where was Casey's child, their granddaughter, Kaylee? The answer to that would take another five months and would end in a dark and gruesome discovery. Two-year-old Kaylee was dead by homicide, and Casey had known that she'd been dead for weeks. My guests today to discuss this case are Cheney Mason and Beth Karras. Cheney is an attorney who served as co-counsel on the Casey Anthony defense team and who wrote the book Justice in America, how the prosecutors and the media conspire against the accused. accused. And Beth is a former prosecutor and journalist who covered this trial from 2008 to 2011 for True TV. Welcome, Cheney and Beth. So good to have you both here. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, So first, let me tell you this, Beth, I'm so happy to see you because I remember being a a young reporter at Fox News and um, following you and following your coverage on Court TV, now True TV, whatever. Uh, And I just always admired you and thought you were such a straight shooter and really smart on the law. So uh, it's fun to have you on. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for that introduction. Of course. And Cheney, you're you're the man. You and Jose are the ones who tried this case and uh, and managed to get this acquittal, which shocked the nation. And um, I'd love to get into all of it because I'd love to take an honest look at, you know, what's real and what's not. We just went through this with, for example, Amanda Knox and compared what was real in her case to the way the media covered it. And there was a very wide delta. Right. So I understand your point, Cheney, that you can't just go by media reports. Um, So we'll get into all of it. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Um, We're at the point where Cindy I mean, it's confusing for the audience that doesn't know the case forward and backward, but Cindy's the grandma, Casey's the daughter, and Kaylee is the little two-year-old uh, granddaughter. Cindy Anthony is uh, the matriarch, and she's letting her daughter, who was only 22 at the time this all went down, live with her. She's got she's an unwed mom, she's a single mom, she's got little Kaylee with her. And they, they tell her, Casey tells her that she's going off on vacation, she's going to go to a couple towns, going to take the, the daughter, the granddaughter. Okay, fine. Then we, we talk about how she discovers that wasn't true. She goes to the car impound lot, and um, she winds up calling the, the 911 uh, operator. At first, what she really thinks this might be about is maybe, maybe there was a stolen car, and then she realizes that um, it's worse than that, that something smells wrong with that car and she doesn't know where the granddaughter is either. Here's soundbite one. My daughter finally admitted that the baby's in the store. I need to find her. Your daughter admitted that your, the baby is where? The baby said it took her a month ago that my daughter's been looking for. I told you my daughter was missing for a month. I just found her today, but I can't find my granddaughter. And she just admitted to me that she's been trying to find her herself. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car today, and it smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. Okay, what is the three-year-old's name? Kaylee. C-A-Y-L-E-E. Anthony. 
And I'll start with you on this, Beth. So that's we were off to the races, because now what we learned on that day is that you've got a young mother who hasn't who by her own admission hasn't seen her child in a, in a month who, who tells investigators she decided to handle it herself and was only caught because the mother was called to that impound lot. Go from there. Right. So I know when we we look back in hindsight, we know what the defense explanation for that was at that time. But when we were looking at this unfolding in real time, people who were following it and I started following it with court TV uh, from the very beginning, it looked really suspicious. Like, why is she looking for this child herself? Why isn't she calling the authorities? She ultimately tells the police she didn't trust them. She wanted to look for her her daughter herself. But we learned that what she's doing in this 30-day period from June 16th to July 15th was, I mean, what's documented, photos of her and uh, other memorializations and text messages, whatever, don't seem to be consistent with looking for her daughter, right? She's partying. She got a tattoo. She's in a hot body contest. And it's like, really, is this woman grieving her daughter? Is she in a panic? Is she looking for this toddler who was two years old and 10 months at that time? Uh, so it was very suspicious. And she ultimately <coughs> gets charged with child neglect, um, and, you know, like failure, crime. Well, Cheney will have to... Um, tell us the exact crimes, but it was like failure to report her child. It was like neglect charges, nothing to do with homicide. That would be down the road. Um, But that seemed to be right because it didn't make sense what she was saying. And she's lying to the police. She's sending them in all these tangents that were going nowhere because she knew the truth and she wasn't telling the police the Mm -hmm. truth. Let me ask you this, Cheney. One of the questions, and we'll get into it with the audience, what your defense was and, and how that went. But At this point in the case, under your theory of the case, when Casey's confronted by her mom, Cindy, you know, where's Kaylee? What's the deal with the car? You know, this is July uh, 15th. Under your theory, Casey knew at that point that her child was dead, correct? No. And your facts about how the car was found are wrong. Uh, the car was found in a parking lot of a shopping center. Uh, George found the car. George drove the car home. Uh, Cindy, at some point after that, has made the call, the infamous call that smelled like a damn dead body was there. Five deputy sheriffs responded to the house, to the car on the same day inspected it, trunk open, doors open, and every single one of them testified under oath that they did not smell anything. So that's another one of these examples that made it made it imaginary. It's not true. Well, wait a second, Cheney. Wait a second. Um, Georgia drove the car home from the pound. It was oh. towed from the lot. It was towed from that parking lot where she left at, a, at the end of June, June 26, I think. And uh, by the time that Anthony's got the paperwork from the pound where it was, it was already July. It may not have been the 15th, but it was early July. Uh, Some, it was July. And then they go to the pound. And, and that's where um, George, he, as he approached the car, he said he really feared. He smelled something that was very familiar to him because he's a former police officer. He really feared when the trunk was open. He was going to see something he didn't want to see, but that didn't happen. But the man at the pound said to him, oh, yeah, I know that smell because somebody else, there was an abandoned car there. And maybe it was a salvage yard. I can't remember a pound salvage yard, but there was an abandoned car that had a dead body in it. He said it was a similar a similar smell. I know that I know what you say is they didn't smell anything. That's true. But there's other evidence of, of odor closer in time to the car being um, so was, obtained by the Anthony's. That once again, we'll, we'll disagree. That's not the facts. The car, the car was found, and George said they had thrown garbage over the fence to a dumpster. Okay? And that's not what was not the impound lot. And they came, and they did not smell anything other than garbage. Then the car was taken. After they had the car to the home, and they had the statements from Cindy, the sheriff's department took it. And they kept it, and it never was returned. It was kept in the sheriff's department for forensic evidence the whole time, even thereafter, months later, I was in the case. The, so it's, it's, so, it's not like yep. it's all that important. The bottom, bottom line is there was an initial claim by Cindy. There's no dispute about that. And the state tried to buttress her 
statement because she was a nurse and she knew what body spell like. That was ridiculous because nurses don't know what body spell like because they don't keep them in the hospital. Okay, but we're getting hung up. I mean, there's no question Cindy said on that 911 call. She she that it smelled like there had been a damn dead body in the trunk. We all heard that. I've heard she George give interviews. I've heard George give interviews where he says it smelled like a dead body. He's he has said that on camera. And the the head of the tow lot, it was the towing company and the man's name was Simon Birch. That's the company that impounded Casey's car in June, oh, no. testified that he had encountered multiple vehicles with dead bodies during his three decades in the business and that the smell from Casey's car was consistent with those past experiences. So let's not get too hung up. I, I, we don't know whether it was, in fact, uh, Kaylee Anthony that created the smell in that car. And I understand that the authorities would argue that. Um, but we don't need to get too hung up on whether people said it because they, they did say it. Um, the, whether or not well, say, that was you know, the smell would be, have to be proven at trial. Go ahead. Say, saying it is one thing. There is no forensic evidence to support that it is any unique order to the decomposition of a human body. So Everyone when they took a look, different. I got it. When they took a look at the trunk, there was not a dead body inside of it. The the grandparents open up the trunk and there is no dead body. There is, however, Correct. large amounts of trash and it's the hot Florida sun. Right. I mean, I've seen the garbage bags. Are you disputing that, too, Cheney? Why are we getting so contentious? No, no. It had it had been in there before she had any contact with it. The garbage bag was thrown out of the car over the fence to a to a public dumpster site. There's no question that, that Cindy said what she smelled. And that made it a very, very alluring claim about the case. And, 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 uh, and matter of fact, that's when they had the air sample test and the forensic scientists testify that what was and was not. It's not really important to the turn of the case, in my opinion, other than it led to causing the attention to the case right from the beginning, exactly as you mm-hmm. said. And it could very well be, <clears throat> under any theory of the case, that that Kaylee's body was was either not in that trunk at any point or was not in that trunk for long or was there and was removed. I mean, what we do know is Kaylee was killed, that Kaylee is dead, and that ultimately her body would be found not in that car. But we'll get to that, that point in the story. But when we learned about Casey Anthony's version of the story was... At the opening argument, or the opening statement at trial, and um, and we'll get to all of that. But under her version, under her version of the case, she, George, her dad, killed. Well, didn't kill, but was with little Kaylee when she drowned. Okay, she drowned. So when no, that's he- that, that's not correct. That's not correct. Okay, George found her. Okay. There's no evidence that George was with this child when she drowned. Okay. He found her and brought her in from the pool and, and confronted Casey. Look at what you did. There is no was evidence that? that he did anything. Right. I know. I'm aware because most of us don't think he did. But when <clears throat> when did that allegedly happen? Well, <laughs> I'd have to go back to the specific dates that you probably have. Well, dates, you just so. told me it hadn't happened at the point she said, I've been with her for a month and I've been out. You said it hadn't happened at that point. So when did it happen? Oh, I don't know. Well, then why are you telling me that it hadn't happened yet at the point? Well, uh, yeah, go ahead. What I'm telling you is, and you said that George was with the child when she died, there is no evidence. No, no, but you're disputing. No, I'm going back to my first point. So you don't know. You, my point is when she was out dancing and getting the tattoos and <clears throat> Bella Vida and doing all the crazy stuff for that 30-day period, did she or did she not know that her child was dead? In my opinion, she did not know. In my opinion, that child had been found and had been disposed of in some capacity long before she was ever brought into any kind of inquiries of whatever. Casey, this is where, where, and you justifiably, and so many other people believe, Casey, you would think, would have known immediately about her daughter. I don't think she did. Our experts didn't think she did. And the jury didn't either. The bottom line is that Casey went into what I have previously characterized as Casey Wool. She was in a total, uh, some sort of state, psychotic state, not acknowledging the child was gone, 
dead and just fabricating whatever she had to fabricate about it. And and it was clear to me, I can tell you, uh, it, whoever watched the trial besides the jury, when we had a grief expert testifying about how people grieve differently in different circumstances, and she talked about it during the trial, the last part of the trial, Casey broke down, I was sitting right next to her. That, in my opinion, was the first time that she absolutely clearly accepted and knew that this child was dead. How did, I mean, she realized that her child wasn't with her for a month, right? You know, I don't know what she realized. That's what I'm trying to tell you. We know from facts and videotapes and witnesses, as you described, she was out on a couple of occasions to uh, young people's clubs and doing shopping and going around and just kind of in another world. And so what she actually knew, I guess none of us will ever know. Well, I mean, her mother All asked her that day that they were reunited, where is Kaylee? And she said, I, she's missing. The, the babysitter took her, and I've been looking for her right. on my own. So she clearly knew right. that she was missing. I'm sure she, yes, that she knew something, but it wasn't connecting in her brain. It didn't connect in her brain until we were in trial, at the end of the trial. That's the problem with it. And it's hard to understand that. And most people don't want to understand that. Most well, people. I mean, you can order. understand it and then and not and just not believe it. Right. I mean, it's of, of, that's, of course that's secret option number two. Right. I, I think the normal, most expected reaction from people was if you found your child drowned, you would call 911 or you do something. That's, that's the normal uh, and reasonably normal expectation of people. Would be for me, would be for you. But I, this is such a weird and unique situation. Uh, then, but are you now saying that she found her? That she found her her child drowned? I did. I did not say that at all. Uh, okay, you we said if normal expectation is, would be if you found your child, and that's not the posit here. The posit is that George, the granddad, found her. If if I found a child, and or if you found a child. Probably the first reaction like that would be to call for help. Mm. I agree. I know, but we were talking about Casey, and then you jumped to George's state of mind. And that's we're talking about Casey's state of mind. I'm not talking about George's state of mind. There's no evidence about his state of mind other than the position was that George found the child on that Saturday morning. She was drowned on Which Saturday morning? Which which Saturday morning? I, I don't remember the dates. That was, well, no, but I mean, seven, are you talking about the beginning of the 30 day period or the end of the yes, 30 day period? At the beginning, at the beginning, okay. Beth may know the dates, but you know, from, from so, looking at June something, wasn't it? Yeah. So the last, um, the last <clears throat> photos of Kay, of Kaylee are on Father's Day, 2008, which I think was June 15th. And then the 16th, she had a fight with her mother the <clears throat> night before, and then she left the next day. Oh. And George saw them walking away. He remembers what they were wearing. That's father, Kaylee's grandfather. And so that was a Monday. She's walking away with them. And my understanding is that, that the defense position was that the, um, that that the drowning of Kaylee was right around then, like very short time after that. Either the night, early morning, night. We, so we had the photographs of the child being able to go out to the pool by herself and do that. And so all we all that we know, our position. Look, I wasn't there. You weren't there. We don't know who was really there to know this, but you never do in any part of your life. The bottom line is that our position has been. From the beginning through the end, it still is. George found this little child. She was drowned. She was deceased. He brought her into the house. He confronted Casey because Casey, he was still asleep. She had been out the night before or whatever the, the case would be and told her, look what you've done. Your mother is going to be really mad at you. And that was it. And she left. And we don't know what happened. See, this is where there's a big gap. And the jury found a gap as well. Did George uh, dispose of the body? I don't know that. I can't prove he didn't. I wouldn't accuse him of it. Something Mm -hmm. happened. And both of you know that something happened contrary to what the ordinary experience would have been. The ordinary experience would have been call 911. Ordinary experience would have made the whole thing right down resolved. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. And all I can tell you is that 
I doubt that the case will ever be solved any more than it has been. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's why you're still interested in it, and people will be and will continue to be for for a long, long time. I don't yeah. know what else to do about that. Well, sure. I mean, this, is, this has been, it was a very salacious trial. It, it happened at an interesting time in our country's history. And, oh. you know, it involves an unthinkable crime that we, we genuinely, we sincerely do not wish to even think about. But when it happens, those, those you know, responsible must be held to account. In this case, no one ever has been. Beth, I know you want to say something. I'm going to get to you right after this quick break, pay a bill and back to um, our guests in two minutes. Don't go away. Black Rifle Coffee Company is a veteran-owned coffee company serving premium coffee to people who love America. Veteran CEO and founder Evan Hafer spent over seven years on the ground overseas with U.S. Special Forces and as a CIA contractor. Evan even modified his gun trucks during the invasion of Iraq to grind coffee anywhere. Coffee's more than a business for him. It's a true passion. Every morning while deployed, Evan would cheers his coffee with his team leader before heading out on patrols. Great coffee has a way of grounding us, no matter where we are. For Evan, it reminds him of cold mornings hunting in the Idaho mountains. Through coffee, Evan was able to experience that perfect morning every day, whether he was in Kabul, Seattle, or anywhere in between. There's nothing better than starting your day with America's coffee. Make your holidays better by giving the gift of Black Rifle Coffee. You want to support the cause? Just go to blackriflecoffee.com slash MK today and check out the freshest coffee in America. America's Coffee makes your holiday shopping easy with personalized bundles, gifted subscriptions to the coffee club, gift cards, and a whole lot of premium coffee apparel and gear. Make your holidays better with Black Rifle Coffee. Blackriflecoffee.com slash MK gets you 20% off coffee, apparel, and gear, as well as 20% off your first month of the coffee club. Beth, you would you were itching to get in there at the end. Go go for it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was um, wanting to point out. I just looked at my notes, and June sixteenth, two thousand eight, was a Monday. So Father's Day was the day before. So it was uh, that Monday was the last time George mm. saw her, and it was the defense position that the drowning was that day. I believe it, later that day. Yeah. Um, the other thing I just wanted to look at the big picture here because I, I know we're going to go through the timeline, Megan, but. Um, you know, Casey does get charged with murder in October and Kaylee hasn't been found yet. And then she's found in, De- in December. Her remains are found. And within a few months, the prosecution decides to up to ante and, uh, and charge her with capital murder, right? Seeking death. So for the next three years, there are all kinds of pretrial hearings and lots of motions are being filed. And all the while, Casey is sitting in a jail cell. So for three years till her trial in 2011, 2008 to 2011, she's locked up. And I don't understand if this was an Mm -hmm. accidental drowning, maybe there's some sort of negligent theory of some kind of crime that Casey could be charged with, but nothing like capital murder. If the facts are what um, what you say, Cheney, Um, I don't understand why you wouldn't go to the prosecutor and say, look, this is an accident. I mean, we have proof. This is an accident. Why let her sit in jail for three years? Or am I being naive? I've never been a defense attorney, but it just seems like, <laughs> you, but like you, you know, prosecutors are, are not unreasonable, at least in my experience. We do justice. <laughs> we do not just seek convictions. We want to do the right thing. You shouldn't overcharge if you, you know, you should never overcharge. I should put it that way. Well, I know you don't believe that all prosecutors are the same way because we know better than that. Uh, The the, the bottom line in in this situation is that uh, this case was going going for a long time before I was brought into it. I was a a citizen of Central Florida all the time with all the news medias and the, you know, every night uh, or every day, all the channels said, uh, you know, more about Casey Anthony, news at six, pictures at six, or whatever like that, every day for a long time. I was a citizen like everybody else until uh, Mr. Baez asked me to come in. I don't know, and you may have a better time of, of, of the when the charge was. I happen to have been in an NBC studio on a totally unrelated matter when the People there got all excited because the sheriff uh, got it, was there doing something, got a call, and he came into the studio and he, like, like his, they found a baby with tape all around her head, 
and we believe that's going to be Kaylee. And that was the first time there was any ability to prove that there was a death, so there could not have been any any uh, criminal charge of homicide against her at that time. They had no proof of death. They had other things, and I don't remember what they No, no, just, just to jump in and set the record straight, according to my, my timeline here, it was October, she, as Beth points out, she was charged with, not with murder, but with child neglect and some other right. uh, small ch- charges first, so that's kind of how right. they got her into into custody. Right. Um, she was declared a person of interest uh, with respect yes. to Kaylee, but she was not yet, yet charged. That's when she right. posted her bond, and the bounty hunter Leonard Padilla came in, and all that happened. And then, on a October 14th, 2008, she was charged with first degree murder, aggravated child abuse, aggravated manslaughter, four counts of providing false information to law enforcement and so on. And then it wasn't until December 11th, 2008, two months later, that the skeletal remains of Kaylee were found. So two months after she was charged with murder. Yeah. And then they seek death after that, because that was the change circumstance. We now have a body. We right. believe tape was around her mouth and nose, and that right. was the change circumstance. That would just yes, and we'll and we'll get we'll get death. to what how the, the condition in which they found the remains, which is which was yeah. the part of the prosecution's case. But let's just go back to the days, the thirty day period that she was not with Kaylee and not with her parents and lying to her parents. And out and about, as we all would wind up seeing. I mean, I remember seeing it on Greta Van Susteren's show every night, you know, the pictures of that would be on Earth from her social media, you know, her dancing, her looking like have a great time. She's got that big smile on. And people looked at this in retrospect and said that is that, that she must be a sociopath. You know, her, her daughter's missing. She's not she's clearly not looking for her. She's having the time of her life. And that was the prosecution's theory that she was, she got pregnant at 19. She didn't want this baby. She didn't want to be a mother. And she wound up either neglecting the child or intentionally getting rid of the child um, to the point of death. So the, what, she takes the police during this time, Cheney, on some wild goose chases that I want you to help me understand if we're, if we're going into, why are you shaking your head? Yes, she did. Well, you said wild goose chases, plural. That's not true. Okay, so hey, did she or her, did she not wall. did she or did she not take them to the fake apartment of some nanny who never existed? <laughs> there was one the beginning occasion. Yes, did, did just she okay, told so them yes. where to go. And did she or did, did she not take them to Universal and pretend to work there when she in fact hadn't worked there for okay. two years? That did she or didn't was, she? That was the one so called chase. The police knew she didn't work there. They picked her up at six o'clock in the morning at the Anthony residence. They drove her to Universal. They checked in Universal. They already knew from security that she didn't work there. They she walked from there about 700 feet down the sidewalk and around the corner into an office building. And she was still carried on going to show them her office. And they took her into the building and got to a small office. And she turned around and said, okay, I don't work here. All and right. Then they, so then they I am correct. I am correct. That's at least two. Those are wild goose chases. You need to slow your roll, <laughs> sir, because I've got my facts. And we're, you and I are not going to do that. This is not that kind of show. OK, trust me. Uh, yeah. I've done my homework. So she took them on a couple of wild goose chases. And you tell me why no. this young mother with no consciousness of guilt whatsoever, because she's in this confused fugue state, not realizing her kid's not with her, would do those things. You tell me. I don't know why she would do it. She did not know, I believe, at this time that this child was deceased. She still had in her mind this myth of where the child was. And that's why the police didn't do anything else at that time to arrest her or charge her with anything, because they couldn't other than to prove the child was missing and they didn't believe her. So well, why was she I, making I up that she worked at Universal and, and making up that there was a nanny and taking them to the fake apartment of the said nanny? I'm not sure that I know. She had worked at Universal. She did work up there to a few months before this occurred. Uh, I can't tell you. This is one of the things that we'll never know as to what went in through her brain to do that. It was so obvious to the law enforcement officers, they knew damn well that she did not work at Universal. They had already through the night confirmed that. And so when she said she did, they said, okay, we'll go along for this little little charade. And that's what they did. They weren't fooled. They weren't surprised whatsoever. 
And that's when we got into a whole issue about you know, whether she was Mirandized or not, whether her statements could be used, and how the appellate court dealt with that and, and reversed two of her misdemeanor convictions. Beth, um, why don't you tell us about the wild goose chase involving Zanny the Nanny, um, who was the one you heard on that very first day that her mother and she called, well, her mother called the police and put her on with police. She was an unwilling participant. She was like, why would I want to talk to them? Um, but she gets on and she claims that she left the daughter with the babysitter and you take it from there. Right. So in opening statements, Linda Drain Burdick does recount almost every single one of those 30 days. There is something, whether it's a text message, an email, a MySpace posting, some communication, something, a photo that will document what she was doing during that time. During those 30 days, she does um, she, she does tell the police that, um, you know, Zenaida Gonzalez, there is really a Zenaida Gonzalez. There's really a person. By there are a lot of Zenaida Gonzalez's. Right. But I mean, there's a person by that name who applied for an apartment for a vacant apartment in that complex. And so there's a, you know, a, a theory. I don't know if it's ever been proven true that that Casey may have seen that application, may have seen that form, you know, and got the name uh. from it because there's a woman who who did apply to to live there. Um and not a nanny no, and not Casey Anthony's no, nanny working no, to protect There's no Katie. connection between them. There's no connection between them. But like where like Casey was telling her parents you know, that she was going to work. They did believe mm-hmm. that there was a nanny, Zanny the nanny. They did believe right. that. So it's very curious. Like where where was this little girl? Like was she like accompanying Casey and where was Casey going? She wasn't you mean working prior to the 30 day period. That's prior, you mean prior but prior, even yeah. during the 30 day period. Now, during the 30 day period, Casey is saying a couple of things, right? She's up in Jacksonville or she's um, <coughs> like in Tampa and then her car broke down and she was in a car wreck or maybe there was a hospital at some point. I, I can't remember exactly I don't um, remember that. everything she, she relates. But um, Cindy, Casey's mother is really getting frustrated because she's, you know, she wants to see her granddaughter. She mm. needs to see proof. The two of them had fought, as I said, the day before uh, you know, Father's Day that night. They had fought. And, you know, there was some talk about, you know, Cindy saying, if you don't get in better shape as a, you know, take care of this child, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to file um, to adopt her. Let me say, though, that at trial, there was the only evidence about Casey as a mother was good evidence. Like she was yep. a very doting, good mother. However, Cindy may have begged to differ only because I think that, that Kaylee was left with her grandmother a lot, that Casey was, was gone, especially closer in time to when the child disappeared because Casey had a new boyfriend and it was sort of a new life and he was working at a club and you know, it was kind of an, a new life and she, maybe she wanted her freedom. That was part of the prosecution. Well, and didn't, didn't well. he testify that she, that he said he did, he was, had no interest in becoming the father, a father. Yeah, correct. Right. Also. Right. Now around July 5th, or so is she got a Bella Vita uh, tattoo, beautiful life tattoo, which also is something that the prosecution pointed out, you know, their theory being, look, you know, maybe you know, she knows her daughter's dead and uh, she's celebrating her daughter's uh, life through this tattoo. She's in a hot body contest. I seem to recall around the yep. June 20th, something, uh, the hot body contest. She's wearing that short blue dress. So, um, these are the things she's doing that she well, says, and, and, but if I can just jump I'm back. actually looking for my daughter. Let's just jump back to the to Zanny the nanny, because what she did, she told the police, I left her with this Zanny the nanny and then I went to pick her up and she was gone. And um, I, you know, I've been looking for her. And so the cop said, do you know where Zanny the nanny lives? And she says, yes. And they said, "Okay, would you take us there? And she took them to an apartment. They went to an apartment Mm -hmm. and it was empty. And it hadn't been leased for months. There wasn't a stitch of furniture in there. So there, there had been no Zanny the nanny living there in that apartment and nobody had been living there for months. So, you know, this is not none of this is consistent with a woman who, in fact, had the experience she was claiming to them. Um, then they she told them that she'd been working at Universal, as I mentioned, and they said, OK, let's go. Oh, she, I think she said she needed her keys or something from Universal. So they said, OK, let's go. Let's go to Universal and we'll, we'll get them. OK, fine. But she didn't work at Universal. So she managed to talk her way through the front security get guards um, with the with the police with her. They get through. They get in. She gives them all sorts of names. I worked with this guy. I worked with that guy. These are made up names. They would later find out she's making up names. Um, 
And then she got past a couple more people and said, oh, yeah, where's my office? She gets turned around. And then as Cheney points out, she was at one point where she got lost. She went down a corridor. There was no way out. She turned around. And she gave it up and said, I don't work here. And yes, they knew. But the point is lies, 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 lies at every turn. And this is what one of the many reasons it's not just I smelled a dead body. It's it's her behavior, her deceit, her throwing the police into the wrong direction time after time, her total seeming lack of empathy or concern for her child, who you're telling me she may or may not have known was dead or alive at that point. Right. So all of this goes into our perception on the outside, Cheney, of Casey Anthony um, and is, you know, I don't so far, I don't see where we're going wrong. I'm, I'm open minded. I'm wanting you to walk me through it because I'm as much as I I'm think she saying, did it. I'm open minded to a different story. I'm not saying that your perception is wrong because I saw it nationwide, if not worldwide. People believe the same sort of things about her. There's no question about that. Uh, there's no question that she uh, did not tell them the truth about a lot of things. The question is, is why and how? Uh, conscious was she of that? Uh, the, you said something I want to correct about going into Universal. The Universal people had already been informed by the sheriff. They knew what they were doing. They were waiting for her to come out there and do that. What I'm always, you raised earlier is another coincidence. I've never understood. Is Anita Gonzalez? Where do you get a name like that? And then and they have a coincidence that there was a, a person by that name that, uh, had applied for an apartment at this place of all of that. that never made any sense to me at all. Well, there's a whole lot of things that, that make sense to me of uh, all these things that matter. Why are you even raising that? Are you suggesting still to this day that there was a Zaneda Gonzalez who had babysat Kaylee and then what George, then Kaylee went home and drowned in the pool after that? Like what, what do you, why are you even mentioning? No, that? How's that relevant? I'm not saying it for that reason. I just thought that when you raised the issue about this is Dana Gonzalez, if nothing else, it's a hell of a coincidence. There is no evidence well, that a very she ever name. had that baby. It's, oh, it's it a, actually turns out to be a very common name. No, my point is, we know that's a lie. We like you don't have to dispute, debate me on whether that's a lie. We know we know that's a lie. Even according to your side, that's a lie. The child was killed according to you in the swimming pool. She drowned, and George found her. Okay. I said in the intro, died by homicide because that is what the medical examiner said. But according to you, she died in the swimming pool. So like there was no Zanny the nanny who ran off with little Kaylee, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's not proper for you to keep saying she was killed. She died. She died by I homicide is what the ME said. You know, homicide by indeterminate means. What? By the indeterminate means, reason. correct. But what <laughs> I said, once again, Cheney, was 100% correct. She died by homicide. Check the report. Much more with Cheney and Beth Karras coming up. We're going to get to the trial, this infamous trial uh, that would rock the nation for a long time. This is one of those things where people could tell you the names of the attorneys. We're dying for information about the jury and so on and so forth. We'll pick it up there in a minute. And remember, you can find The Megan Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east and the full video show and clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Megan Kelly. If you prefer an audio podcast, subscribe and download on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts for free. It's the holidays and you deserve a gift. How about a gift that keeps on giving you joy and comfort every day all year long? A gift that looks as good as it feels and one that will pay for itself in terms of how much more productive you will be at work. I'm talking about giving yourself the gift of an X chair. I love mine. It is by far the most comfortable and ergonomic chair I've ever used. And honestly, it's also probably the coolest looking piece of furniture I own. Not only is X-Chair the world's greatest office chair, but with its patented LMX technology, it doubles as a massage chair. And you can either cool or warm your back. Can your office chair do that? I don't think so. Now's the perfect time to buy one. Purchase an X-Chair now. Buy early, buy now. And here is X-Chair's holiday gift to you. Save $100 off your X-Chair just by buying it at xchairmk.com now. That's the letter X, chair mk.com. Xchair has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 a month. Go to xchairmk.com and save.
xchairmk.com. So let's go to the day that they, uh, Casey Anthony is in jail and she's charged with first degree murder, but they haven't yet found a body. And then they do. Beth, can you take us to, because, you know, the, the, weirdly, the man who found the body, who uh, was a meter reader, would wind up becoming a central figure for a time in this case. There were all these reports about him and it was like, I remember asking myself, why is he anything other than the man who found the body? Like, how did he become more interesting than that? Um, so can you explain that? Explain how he found little Kaylee's remains? Yes, indeed. I'm pulling a lot of this from memory. So you might have to um, sure. fill in a couple of facts here. But his name is Roy Cronk. Now, that day mm-hmm. was December 11, 2008. There was a hearing in the Casey Anthony case that day. In fact, I seem to recall that was the day that Jose Baez uh, waived speedy trial. Um, and uh, not not unusual, you know, for for the defense to do that. I mean, in my experience, um, but we were all in Orlando, like the media was at the courthouse because it was yet another hearing. I remember being at a in a like a little cafe next to the courthouse where all our satellite trucks were, and there was a TV monitor on the wall, and all of a sudden, like a breaking news story comes on a body found and we all turn around, we're staring <laughs> at it. I, I, I was with Carrie Sanders from um, NBC mm-hmm. and, and they're like, uh, Katie may have been found. We all went racing out of that place. Uh, I couldn't up and leave with our satellite truck. We were parked there. So I had to wait everyone else and, and you know, NBC <laughs> and others are on their way to, um, to the scene as close as they could get to where um, the, the uh, tents were being set up and a grid was being created. And it would be days of sifting through this, uh, this property, this wooded area, a quarter mile from where Casey Anthony lived with her parents. And uh, that's where the remains were found. Now, the man who called it in, this meter reader you're, you're talking about, Roy Cronk, claims that he had actually found the body in August or a skull or something in August. And he called yeah. it in for a couple of times in August and he wasn't yeah. being taken seriously. Like a deputy showed up and did a cursory search. This is like a really dense wooded area, which, by the way, had been there had been a storm that summer of 2008 and that area had been flooded at one point, but it was no longer flooded by December. And, um, and Roy Cronk, you know, goes back there. He says to relieve himself because there was an elementary school just down the street, across the street, but down from where the body was found. Um, and so he now has reported again, having found a skull and it's now taken more seriously. Um, I'm not quite sure why there wasn't a more thorough search before. It might have been because it was flooded. Maybe the deputy was afraid of the snakes or whatever. But um, she should have been found a lot earlier than December 11th. So Roy Cronk, it, it's suspicious. I mean, he does call it in months earlier and finally get, it calls it in again on December 11th. So <laughs> yeah, that's a little weird. But there is evidence the body wasn't actually moved. The, there were scattered remains. I mean, she's skeletonized and they're just part, she's in pieces, um, re- regrettably. But um, she had but been the in, DNA, a, like the, in a the, couple the, bags. The loss of evidence, like the DNA and so on over that time, it would have been much more useful to have it in hand earlier. Versus sure. And her it. remains were spread because of animal activity. And but there was a there was a laundry bag, a cloth ra- laundry bag with her that matched one because it had been a set of two that matched another one in the Anthony home. So it came from the home. And I don't think anyone's really um, disputing that. In fact, right. you know, the defense facts that they or their 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 version uh, that they they uh, put forth uh, from openings on was that, um, you know, yes, she died at home. It was an accidental drowning and her body was disposed of. So not really refuting that the bag, you know, belonged to the home, but that was pretty clear. So, I mean, but there was something else much more important that they found on the body than than the bag, which was the the duct tape. Get to that. The tape. Yeah. So (laughs) so, you know, when Chaney described how the the um, somebody from the sheriff's department came to the local TV station and said it was wrapped around the head. I mean, it really wasn't like wrapped around the head like that. I only saw photos. I didn't see the actual, you know, skull, but I only saw photos. But the her hair was in the back. She had long hair. Her hair was in the back of the skull. And there was, like, the, the lower jaw should have come up, should have been separated from the rest of the skull, right? Because everything is, is decomposed. Skeletal. But yeah. it wasn't. 
and the tape was kind of holding holding it together. It seemed like the tape and the hair was all stuck together there. So it was in the front, you know, but there's a lot of slippage. But like, why is there tape there? You know, like mm-hmm. that that was what really got the. They're like. Mm, prosecution was like, yeah, there's no reason to put tape on a skull. Unless you're and wasn't there a heart kid. sticker? No. Yeah, I mean, well, there was a criminalist who was looking at the uh, at the tape and saw the shape, but this heart shape. But then it like went away, right? It was like it was like seen and but not captured in, in a photo or anything. So it was just a testimony, is my recollection. Hmm. And I think that it. It was never like, I don't know if it was proven. I don't know. Somehow it was disposed of, you know, disintegrated or something. I I can can tell you about that. The the heart shaped sticker was found on a piece of trash about 40 feet from the remains and more closely across the street from the elementary school. It was never connected to this forensic scene, but other than it was found and talked about. And and, and Beth is right about the the slippage. Yeah, and the, the the duct tape was not all around the head. Uh, the duct tape had been on the top of the bag, and when the, the decomposition happened and the skin and the material and the hair, there was a part of the uh, hair that had tape duct tape on it, but there wasn't any actually on the skull. And Dr. Werner Spitz testified about all of that and about the. Body. Uh, one thing that you that you said wasn't important. I think I think both of you are pointing out was why was Mr. Croc not taken seriously about finding finding the body? He did. Uh, I think Beth. It was three times, if I remember correctly, that he called and reported and said, "Hey, uh, I'm out here. I, I found this. Uh, looks like a skull to me," and they just ignored him. And mm-hmm. it was like the second or third time they finally sent a deputy. I don't remember his name, and uh, I don't think it's in my book, but a deputy came out to meet him. Beth, you'll remember this. The deputy slipped on the wet grass, and he fell down, and he sold his uniform, and he was mad about that, and that was the end of that investigation. That exact spot, just so you'll know, it was 17 feet and nine inches from the curve of Suburban Drive. And that's a very short distance to, to, to not been found. It had been searched by horseback people, uh, the, as we call the Kissimmee Boys on uh, four-wheel drives. Numerous uh, uh, volunteer walkers and searchers had covered that area and every square, square inch of it for a long time. But can I, well, let me, another, I see the point you're making, Cheney, which is like, what, why wasn't it found if it had been there the whole time? But what well, the reports were that they, had, that, that, that they had massive flooding during that period that we're talking about, that four months, and that there was as much as four feet of water in which the body might, may have been immersed for a, a lengthy period of that time. Well, that Thus was undiscoverable. Suggest- that was suggested, but that wasn't the testimony of the hydrology expert that the state had from the University of Florida came and had tested all around all of that geographical area and did not find that. We don't know. And I'm only 78 years old and I still don't know and I'm not going to know uh, how that body was there, if it was there all that time. There's a certain reason to believe that the body had been moved and brought back there. Can you ever prove that? No, because in order to be able to prove that, you'd have to have evidence of who did it and how they did it. Can't do it. All I can mm-hmm. say is it's un- unreasonable to expect that the body was 17 feet and nine inches from the curve of the road, which was a half a mile from the Anthony house that was searched by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people during that whole circus event Got it. and didn't ahead, find Beth. her. My recollection was that there was actually like plant material growing up through the skull, which indicates it was there the entire time, but it had not been moved. I I don't remember that that is the case. I remember Dr. Spitz talking about how there was at the base of the skull inside, there was some uh, dirt. There may have been some, I don't think there's anything growing through the skull, but I could be wrong about that, but there no. was some growth around it. So. Okay. 
Let me just know. back up and say this on behalf of the sheriff's department. Um, there, they have basically suggested they were they were overwhelmed with tips from you know this case was getting national attention. They had tons of people calling. They had kooks calling. They had legitimate people calling. And this yeah. guy says, "Hey, I work for the city. I'm a meter reader. You should be listening to me when I call in." Um, obviously, it would have been much more helpful to have the remains earlier rather than later. Mm-hmm. But it's just it's a piece of this case now, and uh, you know, for better or for worse, that's when they did ultimately find her. Um, um, the, uh, the, so they go to trial and can we just spend a minute talking about Jose Baez? Because I had not seen him on the national stage. I, I was pretty young in my reporting and legal, uh, well, older, my legal tenure, but young in my journalistic tenure. And, um, my understanding is maybe Janie, you can speak to this, but my understanding is when he got on the Casey Anthony case, he, he he wasn't one of the most storied criminal defense attorneys in town. Like what put Jose Baez in perspective for us then at the moment he, he came on to represent her? Jose was a young lawyer. I think he had only been a lawyer about five years. It may have been, I think that's accurate. He had worked at a public defender's office in South Florida. He was up here and he was uh, working. He was taking cases and, going to court, you know, that's all like young lawyers do uh, routinely. I had never heard of him, never met him, never knew anything about him uh, until he started calling me for uh, suggestions and strategies and questions and so forth. And Mm -hmm. that evolved into finally asking me to get in the case. And, you know, I've made mistakes before in my life, but I agreed to do this, and I thought it was a good one. I, when I met this young lady, I didn't believe she was guilty. I've seen her did several times not. since you, then. You, you did or did, did, not, believe, did not? Did not. And I know her uh, well enough to some extent like that. Uh, she came to my wife's funeral a few months ago, and uh, I spent some time talking with her. Uh, my attitude has not changed about her. My explanations are never going to satisfy you and millions of other people. And I got it. And I can live Well, no, that. listen, I, I have my beliefs having covered it and, and having, you know, had some experience as a journalist and a lawyer. But I'm 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 giving you an open mind to convince me. That's why we're doing these stories. Um, so you have somebody who's probably more open minded than most of the people you're going to get in the journalist chair. And I appreciate you doing this. We're going to pick it up on the opposite side of this break. Much, much more with Cheney Mason and Beth Karras. Don't go away. A lot of us are dealing with financial stress these days. Credit card debt, a tight budget, the fact that we're paying more for just about everything, it can be overwhelming. And at times it can be confusing. But let me offer a possible solution. Call the folks at American Financing, where you will learn more about the benefits of a mortgage refinance from lower rates to shorter terms. They can even help you consolidate high interest debt. Does that stress you out? Call them. So you have one manageable monthly payment to focus on. And here's the best part. You can save up to $1,000 a month with American Financing. Think about that for a second. An extra $1,000 every month. It's possible with their custom loan options. Because their salary-based mortgage consultants will look at your entire financial picture. Finding every way to help you save. No pressure. No obligation. No upfront or hidden fees. Why not learn more? Call them today for a free mortgage review. It will only take 10 minutes when you call 866-887-1201. That's 866-887-1201 or just visit AmericanFinancing.net. The trial. So you you get brought in by Jose Bias Cheney, and you um, you actually were very well known. You were former president of the Florida Association of Criminal Lawyers, um, had been selected by Florida Monthly Magazine of, as one of Florida's top lawyers, and you uh, I read were disgusted by the local media coverage about the relatively inexperienced <coughs> Jose Bias, saying that you had been offended by it. It was one of the reasons why you wanted to get involved. Why? What What was wrong? Well, I detailed that, by the way, in my book, because the Orlando Sentinel newspaper uh, <clears throat> had published a story in the expose on Jose's uh, uh, personal life, uh, uh, being behind in alimony payments or something, and criticize him. I thought it was very unfair. I didn't know him. He was just a young lawyer and I'm a senior lawyer. And, and uh, I felt like it, it just simply wasn't fair. So I, I said, wait a minute. 
let me let me respond to this because at that point in time the prosecutor being alleged as the lead prosecutor was Jeffrey Ashton. In reality, the lead prosecutor was Linda Drain Birdie. But uh, Mr. Ashton, uh, uh, they were talking about how he was, you know, Mr. Mr. Good Guy and all these sort of things. Well, uh, I pointed out to them that he had been personally criticized in several appellate court opinions, reversing convictions because of his uh, misconduct professionally. And mm. Beth will tell you that appellate courts don't mention the names of the lawyers when they reverse them. It's pretty rare uh, that they'll actually identify the person they say did wrong. So I wanted to press you know, treat this treat this kid fairly. That's all. Mm-hmm. He's one of my people. <laughs> you know, treat him fairly and go to trial. Well, and, I mean, what, handle it. what's so extraordinary about it is he wasn't that well known. It wasn't like, uh, you know, Robert Shapiro or, you know, yeah. whatever. Alan Dershowitz. It was like, who is this Jose Baez representing <laughs> this defendant on the biggest case in the country at the time? And as we now would will as we all now know that he managed to secure an acquittal, which left the nation slack jawed. I mean, speaking of Robert Shapiro. That was the other case that was probably of equal notoriety, like where somebody got found not guilty and the country just couldn't get over it, couldn't accept it, couldn't believe it. <clears throat> Beth, can you I'll give you this one because I want to then I want to get um, Cheney to sort of put some meat on the bones. But take us to the moment of Jose's opening statement, because that's the that was the moment. I mean, that was the moment I would say the, the case was. One for him, lost for the prosecution. They never seem to recover their footing. Right. Um, it's my understanding the prosecution got word about maybe six weeks before the opening statement about what their position was going to be, maybe not quite that much time, but um, that it was going to be an accidental drowning. Jose Baez, the whole defense team, played their cards very close to their vest. So I think people did not know uh, where they were going. You know, this was a case that where there weren't many surprises because the law is so liberal and open about documents being made available to the public, right? It's the sunshine state. So so we knew, we the media, we all had like 25,000 pages of discovery. There, were, there weren't going to be any surprises from the prosecution's team because we knew what the investigation was. So the surprise came from the defense when Jose said she wasn't murdered, that she drowned, that it was an accident, and George found her. And, that it, and, and people were like, what? Like, where is this coming from? And that's when I was like, there's no way he's going with this, like, because she's been sitting in jail for three years. There's no way he would have, you know, he's going to go with an accident defense. But, um, you know, what do I know? Um, And I have to say, you know, Jose could not have tried this case alone, because I don't think the law allows it in any state, you know, in a capital case, you have to have two lawyers, Mm -hmm. but also he wasn't he he wasn't credentialed enough, right? Five years, three, five years as a lawyer, you have to practice longer um, in some states to uh, handle a capital case, but you can tack onto your team some more experienced people, which is why Cheney was critical. I credit Cheney with the acquittal in his summation, but mm. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but when when um, Jose said in the opening that it was an accidental drowning, and then he started talking about Casey being sexually abused by her father. Now, wait, because the child. audience at home is like, wait, what? Right. Like they took a, wait, what? Right? That, that was, it, it was a huge turn. Our audience at home just had the same turn we all had at the time, which is, a, wait, right. what? But and that's no, that's what the prosecution got word of in advance, a few weeks in advance. And I, I, I think that they were considering, you know, you know, was is it too late for them to file any charges against George? Probably probably it was. But um, if this you know, were the truth. Um but yeah, so we hear that George has been sexually abusing Casey since she was a little girl. And that, I mean, he said this in opening. I, I, he said, like, it, she would be a little girl and she would have his penis in her mouth and then she'd get on the school bus. Mm. And and that she learned how to live a life of lies. She learned how to be a really good liar because of that. OK, so he's like opened this whole can of worms. And I remember speaking to him when he was speaking to me that night saying, wow, you're putting Casey on the stand, you know, because how are you going to get this stuff in? Because, you know, George was the first witness right after openings and he denied it. And he's like, well, no, not necessarily. I'll put it on to the psychiatrist. I said, yeah, no, you won't. You got to put Casey on. So anyway, um, 
I never reported any of that. But that was a discussion I had with him because based on his opening statement, I was sure that Casey was going to testify. We've seen defense attorneys say certain things in openings and then not follow through because they have a right to do, you know, not to call their client. And you can't comment on it, you know, as a prosecutor at the end, mm -hmm. because a, a, a defendant has a right to to remain silent. And that's what happened here. He made us think that Casey was going to testify and then maybe Cheney talked him out of it or something, but. She didn't testify in the end. And that proof of sexual abuse was never put before the jury. Sexual mm -hmm. abuse by George. He denied it on the stand. And the judge said, you cannot sum up on that because you didn't put on proof of it, even though you rang the bell and opening statements. And as they say, you can't really unring the bell. And that taint was there on the prosecution case on George Anthony throughout the trial. I don't I suspect jurors didn't like him because they, they had just heard Jose's opening and then George gets on the stand. And did the prosecution did the prosecution move for a mistrial after that? I mean, I realize normally it's the defense that does that, but the prosecution can do it. Did no. they? I I don't recall that. No. No. Okay. And at that point, they're still thinking maybe you're going to put Casey on the stand and she's going to bring it together. <clears throat> I don't know. And they're still thinking they're going to win. I mean, they're they're thinking like most of us are thinking it's a slam dunk case and they're going to win. They don't want a mistrial. They they're fine with this one. A win of something. I mean, there are a lot of counts and there were lessers. I mean, maybe not capital murder, but maybe some lesser uh, degree of uh, a homicide. But um, I just remember on that first day thinking, wow, Casey's, if, for them to put this sex stuff on, I mean, Casey's got to testify. How else are they going to get it in? Yeah. And there was no. So just to be clear, a, a lawyer's opening statement is not and a lawyer's closing argument. They're not evidence. That's not, that's just sort of a directional uh, offering for the jury. It's not considered evidence. So technically the jury shouldn't have been thinking about that when they went back into the deliberation room. But, you know, the seed had been planted. As Beth says, it's hard to unring that bell. Now, I know, Cheney, that um, you, you wrote, I think, a story in your book about telling George, I got to give you a heads up. We saw some, because there, there were some letters, I think, Casey wrote to like some guards in jail accusing him and he later said George gave an interview saying he, he claimed it was Jose Baez who said, I, I'm going to throw you under the bus. Um, so did you guys what's your recollection of the what you said to George about it's coming? I told George in my office with the permission of his lawyer. And in a few minutes later, also Cindy gave them notice that it, what was going to happen, that. George is going to be accused of sexually molesting his daughter. I wanted to see his reaction. I can tell you that if someone accused me of molesting my daughters or all my granddaughters, there would be a real issue. It would be me bonding out of jail for having gone across the desk and kicked her ass. Mm. But so I felt the need to tell him. All George did was just look and sigh, put his hands on his laps and no other on his legs and no other response. I thought that was a peculiar response for a father having been accused in some situation like this by a lawyer of, you know, kind of officially, you know, this is what's going to happen. Want to let you know this. And uh, I did. I thought it was the ethical thing to do. And I did. Um, I don't know what impact the whole thing had or didn't have. I will tell you that when Jose made the opening statement the way he did, I was surprised. I guess I was pretty good at keeping my old face calm, but I was I was as surprised as, as many people because I did the same analysis that both you and Beth had. You make that kind of accusation, you got to prove it somewhere, and 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 uh, it's it's. Uh, really bad situation for a defense lawyer or either side to make promises to a jury that they cannot deliver on. Jurors remember it. And while you can say uh, uh, that that uh, opening statements and closing statements are not evidence, that's all book BS because the jurors listen to it. And they do a lot of things they're not supposed to do. And, and they the do it on every authority. trial. Hello. Yeah, sorry, I was just adding, and the lawyers have authority. They have a relationship with the lawyers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the, the, the point is that we give, if we really, really wanted to have pure jury verdicts that were reliable, every juror would be sequestered in every case. 
and they wouldn't have any access to any other information except what was in the courtroom. Well, we can't do that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I've tried a, long, a lot, whole bunch of cases, but probably no more than a half a dozen out of 350 plus that were sequestered. So, mm-hmm. but and you'd have ideal. to sequester them right from the moment of the crime all the way through to the beginning of the trial. <laughs> that's when they take in all the spin. <laughs> yeah, well, you're never going to get that done, are you? So mm-hmm. we do the best we can with trying to uh, uh, give instructions. And I mean, so if you Chief, went but, back, you went, went back to the selection of the jury in this case, it was an interesting process. Uh, Six hundred people we interviewed, and there was a lot of. A lot of bias and prejudice and all kind of stuff that we had to weed out to get a jury at all. So, yeah, I don't know that it's a perfect system. I, I don't know how to do it. So let me ask you this, because I've talked to a lot of the lawyers in OJ and other cases, but the OJ case, I watched a lot of it was going down while I was in law school. Right. And um, oh. I, I think OJ Simpson murdered Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman. But I can see how that jury reached its verdict separate and apart from a nullification issue. I can see how they could have honorably, honestly found that the prosecution did not prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't agree, but I I can see it. What do you think it was, Cheney, about this case that had the same effect on this jury, right? Like, what do you think your best facts were or your best pointing, poking holes in the prosecution's facts were? Well, I don't know. I can say there was a major difference 1991, the OJ case, there was no internet, Facebook, on all this social media, was there? It was just starting, yeah. (laughs) To get to Casey Anthony, and it was dominating the news basically all day of every day for a very long time. And so people were focused on it. I've been asked so many times why this case is opposed to others. Uh, this was because there was a young, cute mother with a, an absolutely adorable little baby victim. And they were white. And all the improper things to say or not do, I'm telling you that I know from my 51 years of trying cases that had major impact on this case. If it probably had been uh, uh, a young uh, African-American mother and child, it may have been in the newspaper and it may not have been. It never in hell would have been what this case is. I also think it, it uh, class matters. I think that um, if, if, if it's a family of means or a family that, you know, you can see sort of has its act together overall, people are more interested. If you see, you know, like a family that's got a lot of criminals in it, white or black or any other race, it's like, oh, it's unfortunate. But OK, I think we all know what happened here. This one seemed to be a nice family. You know, the, the dad was a former sheriff's deputy, the, the granddad, I guess. Um, yeah, they seemed to be a loving set of parents to Casey. She see, she looked like an all-American girl in terms of, like, smiley and bubbly and, you know, hadn't been a career criminal anyway. So it was like, okay, there's a real mystery here because the daughter's missing, right? It was like, we all need to pull together to find the daughter. So it had a lot of elements that would attract news coverage. Um you know, and I, I understand the whole missing white woman syndrome arguments and it's not they're not totally wrong, but I do think class plays a lot into it as well. Uh, and these people, they weren't lower socioeconomic class. They were sort of middle class and not at all the kind of family that you normally see enveloped in, in this sort of a deep crime. Um I want to talk to you about that moment, right? Because we all watched it. It was like the O.J. Simpson. You know, we, the people, find that case of Orange Ol- Orenthal J. Simpson. She stumbled on it. I can remember where I was. This one, I actually was in the newsroom. But the um, the moment this happened, uh, and they read it, I'll just take the top of the, uh, this is soundbite uh, number four. It's kind of long. I'll cut it off after the first one. But let's take a, let's take a look back at that moment. As to the charge of first-degree murder... Verdict as to count one, we the jury find the defendant not guilty, so say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this 5th day of July, 2011, signed for person. As to the charge of aggravated child abuse, then they go on, and you can see the relief, uh, you know, flood over her face, obviously, as anybody would be. What was going through your mind at that moment, Cheney? Were you 
Were you shocked? No, I really wasn't. And because I have some secrets about looking at jurors when they come in the courtroom. And I've been there so many hundreds of times that there are certain things they do or don't do that are pretty revealing to some old coots like me. What'd they uh, what they do? Well, they look at the defendant. Uh, they won't look at the defendant if they're guilty. One or two of them might, but when they come in and do that, you can say, <clears throat> I certainly wasn't confident about it. When the before the jury verdict was read, remember it's handed to the clerk who hands it to the judge, and the judge read it, and I'm reading his face. And it was very clear that he wasn't real happy about this verdict. Uh, and, he spoke uh, out about it later. He was on Dr. Oz saying he definitely thinks she's guilty. Well, he said and done a lot of things he probably shouldn't have. Uh, but uh, uh, like he said, with the defense lawyers like car salesmen or something, I don't know where the hell he got that. But uh, <laughs> the, 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 the bottom line is that uh, uh, the clerk, when you, you didn't play all of it. Because, of course, you can't. But the first thing, when she first started reading it, she stuttered over the not guilty part of it. Oh, my and Lord. Said, oh, yeah. And it, it, briefly, but, you know, you're so tense there. I mean, uh, look, uh, I'm not sure of the statistics. My wife had kept a calendar on stuff. And and uh, I remember her, uh, her best estimate was I have tried something in excess of 350 criminal jury trials in state and federal court. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and fortunately, I've done pretty well. The bottom line was that uh, I was not shocked at the verdict, but I sure wasn't cocky about expecting it to be that way. I, mm. When they first, first, I kept, kept thinking, well, maybe one of the others, maybe one of the others. And then, and then you know, three, boom. And then, of course, the, uh, the four counts of lying to the police uh, you know, who cares? I mean, that, at that yeah. point, that's four misdemeanors, and she'd already served three years in jail. Yeah, so that was done. And the jury came yeah. to its verdict quickly. For them, it was an easy decision, though they, they are now speaking out. I, that's where I want to pick it up after this break. Um, what the jurors are saying, it's fascinating to me, um, and also what she is up to now. I'll leave you with this thought. It's very bad to stumble on the word not when reading a not guilty verdict, indeed. But that, that clerk is in good company. I'm thinking about uh, Chief Justice John Roberts when he messed up the oath for Barack Obama. Remember, and they had to do it again privately <laughs> behind the scenes. Uh, it happens to the best of us. Okay, stand by. Much more with Cheney Mason and Beth Karras uh, coming up two minutes away. So I guess I should ask you, too, uh, Beth, for your your best take on what was the evidence you felt like the jury either ignored, refused to see, didn't get to hear that the rest of us did? Because the vast majority of America is convinced that she did it right and does not agree with this verdict. Right. So, you know, we asked jurors to um, use their common sense. Right. And really, when you, you can, I, I understand where the prosecution was coming from, because it sure looks like Casey is responsible for something. She should not have been acquitted of everything, even neglect. I mean, I think one of the charges was neglect or a lesser. So um, that that was surprising to me. So I think the jurors simply ignored this mother who didn't report her daughter missing. You know, there's there's something in there besides those four misdemeanor lying to police officers. I think there was a lower level felony she could have been convicted of. But what was insurmountable for the prosecution was this allegation of sex abuse by George, which was never proven. And the jurors were told not to consider it. But that was there. That was the elephant in the room. But also uh, Cheney's summation to the jury was very effective because he wasn't talking about the defense proof. He's talking about the prosecution's proof, because that's what mattered. Did they prove every element of every crime beyond a reasonable doubt? And he kept hammering to the jury that the prosecution did not give the jury evidence of how Kaylee died, where she died, when she died, who was with her when she died, but really it was how she died and when she died and where she died. And he just kept hammering that. And that had to have been effective with the jurors. I never spoke with the jurors. But the other thing I wanted to say, two more things, is that um, 
a finding of not guilty is not a finding of innocence. It just Mm -hmm. simply means the prosecution did not have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Secondly, I was sitting in the balcony of the courtroom. There was a balcony in that courtroom. It was a courtroom at the top of the courthouse, I think, that's sort of designed for um, you know, media coverage and high-tech stuff for the, you know, to present to the jury with evidence. And so we were relegated to the upstairs, a small balcony. So I'm there sort of craning my neck, watching the jury on the left and Casey and the defense team on the right, the judge straight in front of me, but from above, bird's eye view. And I didn't, you know, I couldn't, I didn't have Cheney's uh, uh, point of view so i couldn't see jurors you know but i was aware that the man who became the jury for person he had connected with with uh, casey i'd seen that on a prior day as jurors were filing out of courtroom <coughs> he stood he was in the back row and he stood there and he stared at her and he lingered looking at her and i thought oh boy. that doesn't bode well for the prosecution anyway when i heard the first not guilty i thought surely there's going to be a guilty somewhere and i just leaned back and took a deep exhale and thought oh my god i was as surprised as everyone that there wasn't some guilty of a some level of Mm -hmm. felony. Can we just round back to two other points I neglected to mention, which get raised on why people think she's guilty? Um, The chloroform, there was testimony that the guy who tested the the trunk test uh, found the odor of decompensation, found one hair that was consistent uh, at the edges with Kaylee's hair and and may have had some decomposition on it. And then there was uh, an allegation that there had been Google searches on the family home. I mean, I've heard everything from a whole litany of searches of like, how do you kill somebody? How do you make homemade weapons to for sure? They testify that that there was a search done for chloroform for chloroform. You know, there was a search on chloroform and to the point where Cindy Anthony had to take the stand and say, it was me. It was I who searched for the chloroform. Um, and I don't know if the jury bought that or not, but can you just speak to the evidence of like the forensics? I'll give it to you, Beth, and then I'll let you respond, Cheney, which I, I can see you want to. So this was a faux pas, I think, on the part of the prosecution. Not that they introduced this, that they didn't do enough because only after the trial, I think it was in Jose's book, but I, I heard Jose talking about it. Did, he knew, the defense team knew that there were a lot more searches for chloroform than what the prosecution knew because the prosecution only checked one search engine and <laughs> didn't check Firefox, only checked Mozilla or vice versa. And um, uh, Jose, and I assume you too, Cheney, knew that there were a lot of searches for chloroform, but it didn't come in because they didn't, the, the um, sheriff's department did not search all of the search engines on Casey's computer. Um, and when, when Cindy got on the stand and said, I was searching because, I don't know, one of my tree, uh, something chlorophyll, chloroform, it was, it just sort of defaulted to the wrong word. I recall her saying it didn't make sense because she was punched in at work at the time she said she, you know, at the time of the search, she was actually at work. So, it, you know, that, that didn't fly, you know, with some people, but, but that, then they found some, the didn't they, Beth, they found some chloroform in the back of the trunk. No, I, I no? don't remember. I okay. Call that. No. Okay. I thought that there was uh, <clears throat> there was some evidence. I- I'll look it up. There's no. something to that effect in the record. I'll, no. I'll pull it up for no. you. Go ahead, Guccini. What what handle the chloroform <laughs> and the searches? As far as the searches are concerned, uh, you're talking about computer stuff, and I'm not the best guy to do that. I like my generation of dealing without them. Uh, the bottom line is, as in my book, I have made it very clear that the man who was in charge of all that corrected the error that the state had made and said there was only one church, one, for chloroform. Uh, Secondly, the order of the trunk or whatever it was uh, from that, uh, not only did I go and sit in the trunk and smell it and do as as rest of my experts did, um, I hired a forensic expert college professor, PhD, who did uh, studies of the air samples that had been taken. And what they found on the, on the graphs uh, the, uh, of, of the analysis was not chloroform. It was surprisingly gasoline. There was no detection of chloroform. Now, there was this, this uh, guy who studies roadkill, uh, what was uh, I, I know his name. I'm not going to repeat it. It's in the book that that had uh, talked about how he had all these uh, 
body farm issues and uh, we went up to go through all that in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, of what odors were and they captured odors and they tried to show us that there was a, a, a graph uh, produced that showed spikes of uh, chloroform or something and that turned out not to be accurate. And uh, there was never any chloroform found in any way residual or otherwise anything to do with this case, no matter how many uh, labs and government officials tried of, to do so. And the okay, reason but, they did. But can I just ask wait, you if we're talking about the same thing? This is where I got it from. Uh, this is an ABC <clears throat> News report, June 22nd, 2011. A forensic chemist, I think this is your guy, uh, you, you were whose name you were uh, searching for, Michael Sigmund. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. He testified in the Casey Anthony trial. He said today the car belonging to the mom accused of murdering two year old Kaylee did not test positive for human decomposition. He is a chemist at the National Center for Forensic Science. He said that air samples from Casey Anthony's car trunk tested positive mainly for gasoline, chloroform and two other chemicals were present. So there was chloroform, but the question is from what and what does that tell us? Okay, so what it did tell us, it was such a minimum amount, they used a, another car that was bought at random uh, from the prosecution. Uh, I can't remember where it was now. Uh, same make, model of car, year and everything, and they brought it in and they tested it and they cut out carpet from the trunk The same, and they got the same readings from this random mm-hmm. car as mm-hmm. they were in Casey's car. So this is just a lot of people hauling bodies around in old Fords. Uh, just, it just was not, it was not reliable. Did evidence. the owner it's of that car do searches for chloroform on the, <laughs> on the internet? <laughs> the no, the, 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 gov- the government did. Can I Go add ahead, Beth, about what, what, yeah. what, what Cheney said um, about the searches on the computer? He's right that um, a witness got on the stand to, to correct <sighs> the the record and it was actually one search but that was on one search engine there was another search engine that the prosecution didn't uh, discover that jose Baez talked about after the trial that had a lot of a lot more um how do we explain that evidence how do we explain the multiple multiple searches for chloroform well there weren't that's why she's trying to tell you yes there were no she's saying there were yes she's no she's on my side another search engine on another search engine yeah, there were okay. um, more searches more. I mean, there might have been for more things, too. Like yes. Homemade a weapons. Is that breaking a neck. Or is it homemade, yeah, yeah. Breaking a neck. It's a uh, hold on. I wrote it down. Something like remember, uh, remember how to first... chloroform, how to make breaking a neck, suffocation, undetectable, how to make homemade weapons. And that's pretty good evidence for the prosecution. Pretty speculative evidence, but no forensic connection whatsoever. They had first claimed there were 84 searches for chloroform on this computer. I know I you said that, but... I think that was the number. And then the people that did that correctly said, no, there wasn't. There was only one. And when you put it up... On the I one remember- search agent. But you can get multiple search engines on one computer. That's what Beth's trying to say. So on the one, they had overstated it on this one search engine, and they had to take it back down to just, oh, sorry, just one on the one search engine. What she's saying is, according to Jose's book, and I've read this in news reports as well, there were multiple searches for chloroform on the other search engines on that computer. They were very well, interested mm-hmm. in that house in chloroform yeah. and other ways of killing somebody. And they never found any chloroform right. anywhere. That's the important part. Except the trunk of the car. <laughs> Just saying, I know I know your point about the other car, but this, yeah. this one has extra circumstances. All right, I get it. Listen, I get it. Let me yeah. talk to you about this juror. I found this fascinating, fascinating. Uh, A male juror spoke with uh, People Magazine, I think it was. Yeah, People Magazine right after the trial. And then, and the trial was, the verdict was in 2011. And then they just spoke with him again, 10 years later, in 2021. And just let me read part of it to you guys and to the audience, because I'm sure not everybody's seen this. Uh, A month after, he said to People, look, none of us liked Casey Anthony at all. She seems like a horrible person, he said. But the prosecutors did not give us enough evidence to convict. They gave us a lot of stuff that makes us think she probably did something wrong, but not beyond a reasonable doubt. Ten years later, writes People, the same juror has been rethinking the case. Quote, I think of the case at least once every single day. It was such a strange summer. I knew that there was public interest in the case, but it wasn't until after I was sequestered that I realized the whole world was watching. 
Um, then it says the juror said he found the prosecutors to be arrogant. Uh, they did not like the prosecution. Man, it really is important what the lawyer's relationship is with the jury. While lead defense attorney Jose Baez was the one in the room who seemed like he cared. They said the other lawyer, Cheney, can be argumentative at times, but winds up being a charmer. No, that was me, Cheney. <laughs> 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 um, he goes he goes on um his focus now is on little kaylee every time i see her face or hear her name i get a pit in my stomach it all comes flooding back i think about those pictures of the baby's remains they showed us i remember casey i even remember the smell of the courtroom and then says this the enormity of the acquittal bothered them in the jury room and then we sat there for a few minutes and we're like, holy crap, we're letting her go free. Everyone was just stunned at what we were about to do. One of the women jurors asked me, are you OK with this? And I said, hell no. But what else can we do? We promised to follow the law. Now this juror says he might have done things differently. This is your point, Beth. My decision haunts me to this day, he says. I think now if I were to do it over again, I'd push harder to convict her of one of the lesser charges like aggravated manslaughter, at least that or child abuse. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and I didn't stand up for what I believed in at the time. Whoa. What do you make of that, Cheney? I'm not surprised. People rethink, question themselves about things they do in their daily life all the time. And I understand that fellow talked about now he have second guesses. Well, people, like I say, do that about their own personal lives. All day. Mm. Oh, I wish I had to said that, or I wish I had thought of this, or well. And or the other something. thing is, then he gets out, <laughs> and there's all sorts of blowback. I'm sure you know the jurors remained mm. anonymous, but get all all this blowback, and you're thinking, oh my god, maybe I got it wrong. And we see more evidence and different evidence, and experience these cases in a different way than the jury does, which is why we have to respect their decision. You can't, you can, you can second guess it for yourself and say, well, I don't agree with it. That's fine. But you have to be, treat the jury with honor because unlike the rest of us, they sat there and, and had the experience, the best we can offer as a, as a justice system. I have yet to see one that does it better than we do.